We're continuing with the uh, book of Jeremiah, as you know. We had the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost as the last spring holiday. And of course, prior to the Pentecost and uh, for the very same day, I want to deliver you some relevant messages for the season because it says that we are to give the good food, the right food at the right season. And also, since it happened that last month, it was the golden or the platinum jubilee of Queen Elizabeth. And we happen to live in a time when this is certainly the last monarch that was occupying and has been occupying the throne of David for 70 long years. I wanted to remind you, I wanted to take the opportunity, that unique opportunity once in our lifetimes, to remind you of the significance of the throne and its origin. So, being Philadelphia remnant, you know that the Philadelphia church era, it is given to have the key of David, which means that the Philadelphia church era does understand the identity of the house of David, as well as, by extension, it does understand the identity of the house of Israel. Now, since we have... So since I've taken the advantage of those unique opportunities, now we come back again to analyze the book of Jeremiah, which has some precious and timeless messages, precious and timeless lessons for all of us today, brethren. And also keep in mind that uh, the prophecies of the Bible are, uh, are, are, are in duality, they're dual, which means what happened once will happen again. But this time when it happens again, it will be on much larger scale. So chapter 7 this prophecy was delivered in the beginning of Jehoiakim's reign on the occasion of some public festival. Now Jeremiah the prophet stood at the gate of the temple in order for the that the multitudes coming from the country might hear him. And after Josiah's death, and Josiah was the last righteous king on the throne of David when it was located, when the throne was located in the promised land. So after Josiah's death, the nation relapsed into idolatry through Jehoiakim's bad influence. The worship of Jehovah was, however, combined with all that bad influence, as we are going to see now in this chapter, and especially in verses 4 and verse 10. Uh, Jehoiakim, or Jehoiakim, however you pronounce it anyway, but... Uh, it's one of those last kings of Judah that were sitting on the throne before the throne happened, before the uh, uh, the last Jewish king, Sedekia, was crowned and uh, he was consequently taken into captivity into Babylon and all his sons were slayed before his very eyes so that the Babylonians thought that by doing so they have exterminated the throne of David and the throne of the house of Judah, but that was not the case as you know because it was there, there was the prophet Jeremiah who found a couple of princesses and he took them with him and uh, as a remnant, Jewish remnant, they went to the lost house of Israel, meaning the British Isles and there we had this one of these princesses getting married to the Irish prince who was uh, descendant of the Zara's line of Judah family and the two lines the line of Phares from which King David and his successors came and the Fares, and the line of Zara came together and from there ensued a long list of Irish monarchs the uh, throne of David was later overturned and it just uh, went to Scotland and then it was overturned for the third and the last time and it went to London. Now that throne is waiting for the return of the Messiah to whom it belongs and Messiah is going to, brethren, return it where it rightly belongs which will be in Jerusalem once the remnant of Israel is restored after Christ's return in the promised land and then the king David, the resurrected David will be ruling over those 12 tribes, of course, under the rule of and under the, the authority of Jesus Christ. And then the remnant of Israel, ruled by David's throne, will become finally what God always wanted Israel to be. To be. It will be the role model for the rest of the humanity, so that the rest of humanity will have to look up, somebody to look up to and say, oh, this is how God, true God, is to be served. Now let's start reading verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, so in other words, do not trust in these lying false prophets, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Well, brethren, you see, the Jews falsely thought that because their temple had been chosen by God as his peculiar dwelling, that it could never be destroyed. You know, men think that ceremonial observances will supersede the need of holiness. The triple repetition of the temple of the Lord in verse 4 expresses the intense confidence of the Jews. Now, Jehoiakim had just been uh, crowned, so he had just ascended the throne, and he was so incensed at this message from Jeremiah that he would have put Jeremiah to death, but for the influence of Ahikam, one of his, one of the, uh, one of the royal servants, one of the, one of those servants at the, at the palace, because of the influence of Ahikam, he didn't do that. With the ascension of Jehoiakim, all hope of averting the ruin of the country had passed away. Because Jehoiakim represented the reverse of his father's policy, and he belonged to that faction who placed their sole hope of deliverance in a close alliance with Pharaoh, Egyptian Pharaoh called Neho. The worship of the true God was no longer an object of the public care. At this time, upon a public fast day, appointed probably because of the calamities under which the nation was struggling, Jeremiah was commanded by God to stand at the gate of the temple and address the people. Verse 5. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Verse 8. But in those lying words uttered by your false prophets, that's what Jeremiah was telling them on behalf of God. So you're listening to the lying words uttered by your false prophets who promise you peace and who tell you smooth things and they smooth you up in your lawlessness of which you do not want to repent. Verse 9. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. You see, brethren, Jeremiah accuses them of trusting in the ceremonial of the, uh, in the ceremonies, ceremonial things, ceremonies of the temple, instead of leading holy lives. You see, people usually don't want to lead holy lives. They just love ceremonies. Especially the Gentile nations. But even the Israelitish nations are not much different. They just love to perform ceremonies. And then they think they are absolved from all their sins. And they can just go and sin even more. And they can just, you know, all until the next round when they have another round of ceremonies. And then they are absolved from their sins. And, you know, they are so kind of pleased to God. And then they just went out of their churches of this world. And they just continue living godless lives and breaking the law of God. And they th think that they will never be punished or they will never give account for what they are doing, brethren. So Jeremiah accuses them. They are trusting in ceremonial ceremonies of the temple that that will be their deliverance instead of leading holy lives. You break, he says, the Ten Commandments and then you go to the temple. And when the service is over, you say, oh, we are delivered. We have atoned for our past actions and may start afresh with easy mind to pray God's law. That's better what churchianity of this world does believe. But of course, it's a terrible deception that comes from Satan the devil. Verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. But go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Uh, Jeremiah shows, brethren, that the ark had not always been at Jerusalem, you see. It was at one point in Shiloh. The place, in fact, first chosen as the center of the nation's worship was Shiloh, a town to the north of Beth-el, situated in the powerful tribe of Ephraim, 
which you can track and find in Joshua chapter 11, uh, sorry, Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. Now, the ruin of Shiloh is described in Psalm 78, verses 58 through 64, and it is ascribed to the idolatry which prevailed in Israel after the death of Joshua. So a similar ruin, due to similar causes, should fall on Jerusalem, says Jeremiah, in verses now 13 and 14. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer, therefore I'll do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I'll cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. You see, the posterity of Ephraim, God says to Judah through Jeremiah, the posterity of Ephraim was superior to you in numbers and power. They were ten tribes, and you're just two, Judah and Benjamin. Ephraim, as the leading tribe, represents the whole ten tribes. Now we know that what God did to them, brethren. He scattered them into the nations, took away their promised land from them, and they lost their identity and wandered into all the nations. However, unlike the ten tribes, the Jews were scattered into all the nations, by, but they largely preserved their Jewish identity. Verse 16, Therefore, do not pray for these people, nor lift up your cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Well, if you want to get a nice smelling pine tree in your home, that is okay, brethren. But don't do it in December and try to tie Christ's birth to it. There is nothing wrong with the families getting together, certainly not. But you cannot worship God by pagan practices. So in this verse, we have a description what the children do, what the fathers do, and what the mothers do. They make hot cross buns and all the cakes to the Queen of Heaven, called Ishtar or Astarte or Astarot. Ishtar after who the famous pagan holiday Easter, which is proclaimed as the greatest Christian holiday, is named. So you see, they make hot cross buns and all the cakes to the Queen of Heaven. It is truly interesting how the counterfeit is, you see. Sure enough, there is no Queen of Heaven. There is the King of Heaven. God is the King of Heaven, as proclaimed in Daniel 4, verse 37. But there is no Queen of Heaven. There is no Easter Astarte, but that is their Easter worship, brethren. You see, the Jews, even back in, the, in those days, had their Easter worship. Verse 19. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the same of their own faces? Are they to provoke me, God asks, you know. Human, dirt, flesh and blood. The reason I'm angry is that because of their stupidity, I cannot bless them and I cannot let them do what I created them for. You know, I'm God. Do they provoke me? No, brethren. The mortal human dummies... Human beings are dummies that hurt themselves. They don't provoke me. I'm the great God who created them out of all the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into them. They're provoking themselves to the confusion of their own faces, going around thinking they're Christian, but they're actually heathen. Verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury will, I, will be poured out on this place, on men and on beasts, on the trees of the field, and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. So you see, the very spot they, that is supposedly holy, <coughs> the temple of God in Jerusalem, his fury is going to be poured out. Man, in this verse, is Adam here. Now, when we read this, we recognize that some of the trumpet plagues of Revelation are supernatural wrath of God, because look at where it is poured out. Verse 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. 
For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. You see, brethren, that was not the part of the covenant. Sacrifices were added later. Why? Because they did not, the Israelites did not keep the covenant. They transgressed. So God says, so I had to add sacrifices later. Now this is verse 22. This is one of the key verses in the Bible, brethren. And the only church on this earth that does understand it, it is the church that you are in. No other church understands it. You know, the holidays are not rituals. Tithing is not a ceremonial law. It is not just Levitical law either. It preceded the Levitical people and it went after the Levitical people and it went on, you know, after the Levitical people. Tithing, when we remember, it was Abraham, our forefather in faith, who was tithing to Melchizedek. Later we read, and we were reminded in the Sabbath prior to this one, we were reminded how Jacob promised to God to give him the tenth of all of his uh, possession if God would bless him and keep him and, 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 and rescue him. So God says, I did not speak about the sacrifices and all this ceremonial law at all. That was added later. In Exodus 20, God spoke the Ten Commandments. The ritual of sacrifices started in Leviticus, brethren, you see. It was added later because of the stubbornness of their hearts. Verse 23, But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I'll be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet, they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. You, yet, they did not obey me or incline the ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. So you see, from the day they went out of Egypt, they wanted to rebel and they wanted to go back and they wanted to listen to the rebels. Verse 27. Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. So you shall say to them, This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Well, this, you know, this is the nation. This is the nation. Brethren, it's the definite article which is actually here. It doesn't say this is a nation. No, it says this is the nation in the original. The definite article is actually here. The nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord. You see, truth, truth has perished. So it is all paganism. And that's one of the main things that are going to condemn the modern house of Israel, especially the Anglo-Saxon nation, as I pointed out today in Serbian. You know, many Anglo-Saxon people are not really that kind of evil-hearted or, or, or bad people who want to try to hurt others. No, they're not. But the knowledge of the truth is present in, if, if there is any language that has so much knowledge about the truth and the true way of God, is English language, brethren. If there is any nation that was so blessed by God materially, it was, it was a bunch of Anglo-Saxon nations. There were individuals, outstanding individuals, even the Protestant individuals who dedicated their whole life and spent their whole life researching biblical history and trying to portray to us the biblical history. The problem with the Anglo-Saxon world is their knowledge, as I explained to one of our one of our friends, one of our baptism candidates in England. I talked to him on Thursday. And it was him, he said to me, well, you know, the British are not that bad, you know. I know, I said, Harry, they're not. There is one thing that does condemn you, which is so different from the rest of the world. It is the knowledge. Because you British people know what is the true day of rest. You people know that Easter and Christmas are totally pagan and have nothing to do with Christ, yet you intentionally choose to believe lie and to celebrate lies and to celebrate paganism. Your heraldry testifies to you that you are people of God. You cannot deny your heraldry. But you are closing your eyes to that fact and you're saying, no, we don't want to be people of God. We want to be pagans. 
Brethren, that's the same thing here we read in the book of Jeremiah. The house of Judah wanted to be pagans. No, we don't want to be God's people. We want to be pagans. The same is today with the Anglo-Saxon world. There is so much precious knowledge about the Bible, you know. I mean, take for example, one example, Adam Clark. Yes, he's a Protestant commentator, but in his comments you'll find, with all the backup and uh, with, with the arguments, for example, he, he, that he gave in his commentary, he says that Jesus Christ could not be possibly born on December 25th. How amazing is that? It's written there in English. In, you know, it's, it's something that should be a common knowledge. And it is a common knowledge that Christmas has nothing to do with Christ's birth. Many Anglo-Saxons know that, but they choose to close their eyes and say, well, it doesn't matter. We celebrate Christ now. To my, my response to them is, no, you cannot, you don't, you're not celebrating Christ. You're celebrating false Christ. Because the true Christ was not born on that day, and you know that he was not born on that day. So it's a false Christ that you're celebrating, number one. And number two, you can just, you cannot, you can call, uh, you know, you cannot make a black man a white man, or a white man a black man, or whatever. You cannot choose and change the character of those holidays at your wish. You cannot, because that's not the way how it works. God is eternal. He knows what those holidays are, to whom they are dedicated, and how many children were murdered in sacrifice during those holidays. The fact that you've just, you know, kind of colored those holidays and said, well, put the label Christian on it doesn't change the nature of those holidays. It's satanic anyway. That's the problem with the Anglo-Saxon nations, brethren. Perhaps not even... Well, there are many of people in Anglo-Saxon who are morally crooked, but it's not even moral crookedness. It's the knowledge. Because God says He's not looking at the time of, non, you know, of those when people don't know what they're doing. So He doesn't, He, He starts to judge each one of us once our minds are open to the knowledge of God. Well, you see, the history of Anglo-Saxon world is very much rich with very good knowledge about God's way. But the Anglo-Saxon people don't want to be God's people. They want to be pagans. So God says, yeah, is that what you want? Fine. I'm going to send you a bunch of pagans from the continent when paganism originated, which is the European continent. And on that continent, Constantine the Great, by the way, was born. And guess where? He was born in Serbia. So what is this world uh, practicing today are actually Constantine's Christianity with all of its paganism and, and, and evil that he had done to the original Christianity anyway. So God says, yes, you want to be pagans? I'm going to send you a bunch of pagans led by the chief of those pagans, Germans. And I'm going to show you now how it is to be pagan, because you'll be now serving foreign gods under their rule, and you'll be eating unclean things, and then you may remember how evil you were. You want to be pagans? Fine, let me show you how pagans really are, how they're crooked in their character as well. And only 10% of the Anglo-Saxon world will repent, according to what we read in Ezekiel 5 and 6. Brethren, is the knowledge. Knowledge is very important. Little knowledge creates <laughs> much... Uh, what, did, what does it say in English? I can't remember the exact word now. But little knowledge, you know, gives you torment in a sense. Well, how about much knowledge? The Anglo-Saxon world has had much knowledge about the true way of God. And the Anglo-Saxon world... Could not care less with all of these liberal, liberal movements and stuff. One of our Baptist and Canadian in Serbia says, can you believe this? They're demonstrating in America for the right to kill their own children by abortion. I mean, ludicrous. But it's true. Many Americans do not demonstrate for that, but many do. And it's the case in the rest of the Anglo-Saxon world. The Anglo-Saxon world has become a leading power in this world with all kinds of crooked, deviating, horrible, abominable things. And agendas. And it's trying to force the rest of the world to follow in that crookedness. You know, the American ambassadors today serve to promote the LGBTQ plus agenda in other words, in other cultures. That's not going to go well. But many of you Americans have no clue about that because, you know, your State Department doesn't tell you that the ambassadors of America are instructed and obligated to spread all that all that kind of agenda that is totally strange to many cultures. But of all the nations on the, world, on the world, brethren, the Anglo-Saxon nations have been given the most knowledge about the true way of God. But the Anglo-Saxon world doesn't care. That's what, what, what condemns the Anglo-Saxon world. Perhaps even more than various moral 
uh, indiscretions or various moral crookedness. More, the, the more the crookedness of morality you find very much so in the Gentile nations. Dishonesty you find much more in the Gentile nations than you would in the Anglo-Saxon world. All kinds of cruelties and crimes and stuff and uh, genocides you'll find in the Gentile nations, but not in the Anglo-Saxon nations. And then someone will say, well, okay, well, why then God is going to punish them this much? Well, brethren, he's not going to punish, he's going to punish the Anglo-Saxon nations because of the knowledge which the Anglo-Saxon nations reject. Because everything screams that they're God's people. From the heraldry to various commentators that they have in English language. But they say, no, we don't care. We don't want that knowledge. We want to be pagans. We want to be liberals. We want to be killing our children with abortion. We want to, we want to do whatever we wish. You know, freedom to do whatever you wish. That's why God is going to punish the Anglo-Saxon world so severely, brethren. That is why. Because of knowledge. But keep in mind, we also have much knowledge, don't we? And, you know, we must not we become, we become haughty, you know, just like Laodiceans. We are so rich, rich in knowledge. And we become so rich, so, you know, now we can be a Laodicean. We don't really, we're so rich, we don't need really to read the Bible that much. We don't need to pray to God that much. We don't need to ask God to intervene in our lives. Well, look, we are rich. We have so great knowledge. And with this knowledge, we are going to make it. No, they're not. They're not going to make it with knowledge because, but in knowledge... Uh, repentance is not based on knowledge. And repentant attitude is not based on knowledge. It's based on the attitude of mind. And no matter how rich we are with the knowledge, we must never allow ourselves to grow into the Laodiceans and to be so haughty and you know think that we are now so, so important and so great because we have so much knowledge that the rest of the world does not have indeed. By the way, I'll be posting some doctrinal short uh, messages on my YouTube channel based on basic Bible doctrines, brethren. Uh, eternal judgment, what does it mean? God's government in, uh, the government of God in God's church. Uh, I'll be posting more, some of those basic things that the world has twisted and does not understand. Please pay attention if you haven't. Please visit my YouTube channel because those are messages usually half an hour. And in those half an hour messages you'll learn, you'll hear what is, for example, the eternal judgment from how it is described in the Bible. Because so many of key essential topics in this world, including Christian things like salvation, repentance, etc. Yes, I have, have you really repented? I've just posted it, I think today, or I'll post it tonight. But you'll find those things useful, brethren. It's knowledge, very important knowledge, for us as God's people, to understand. But the Anglo-Saxon world does have a basic knowledge of the true way of God. They know the true day of God, the true day of rest. They know what, that, 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 you know, Halloween and all that rubbish other holidays are not really of God. They do know it, but they refuse to use that knowledge. We must not be, we must not be arrogant about the knowledge that God has given us, but at the same time we have to be using that knowledge because the knowledge is given to us to be used. Not that we will be academically now kind of arguing with one another or just, uh, we're going now to academically, you know, debate and see who is now the smartest of all of us and all that stuff. Brethren, that's wrong. Use the knowledge. Again, visit my YouTube channel if you wish. I'll be posting now in the next days those short messages on basic doctrines of the Bible. Brethren, we have to understand them because we need to understand the Bible in order to qualify for the kingdom of God. Anyway, back to book of Jeremiah. So this is the nation, the definite article, the nation that does not obey the voice of God. Now, truth has perished, as it says in verse 28. So it is all paganism. Can we think of the truth that they have today, brethren? Can you think of the truth that they have today? Yes, they have got the truth that Jesus died for your sins, sure. But they don't know what sin is. They don't know, they don't have anything, anything right apart from that, that Christ died for our sins. But they know they know that Christ died for sinners. But none of them are sinners because they don't know what sin is. So really that's why, how the truth is cut off from their mouth. And also I've delivered one more. There will be one more message you'll find on my YouTube channel. Very short message. What is the purpose why God created man? And in that message you'll learn once again and reiterate and reinforce your knowledge that God is a family. He created man so that we can be born into God's family as God's brethren. That sounds blasphemous to the rest of the world, to this churchianity, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. We need to know what the Bible teaches us. We need to stand firm in the faith, but never be haughty about it. Well, we're here reading about the Jewish people, right? 
because Jeremiah was was uh, witnessing to the Jewish people. Well, the Jewish people know also how to kind of bargain with God. You know, they know how to kind of get around the the, the truth. Let me give you one practical example. Example. In the state of Israel, when it comes the day when the days of uh, unleavened bread come, when they're around, well, the Jews, those who are involved in bakery and bakery business, they know that they could no they could no longer make you know bread with 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 uh, with yeast, and bread is very uh, Jewish and Serbian culture are very specific because bread is very much present in both of those cultures, but even the cultures on the Balkans like Bulgarians, Albanians, Romanians. Uh, you'll find that bread is one of the staples, you know, and the bread is consumed in large quantities. So, the Jewish culture is no different. So, what the bakery, the owners of the bakery industry do? Well, since they'll not be able to produce now bread on their own, and they're Jewish, so they're supposed to keep the days of unleavened bread, but, you know, the business may suffer some financial loss. What they do, they take the Russians, because there are plenty of Russians in Israel, or Russian Jews who are very much secular, so they lease their uh, production uh, uh, um, facilities to those Russian Jews, Russians, who just continue, because they don't care about the law of God, they will just produce, you know, whatever, they'll just produce all... Uh, products with yeast, so the, the the business would not suffer. So you know that, that's how they get around. Oh no, it's not us. We're not making. No, we just lease it to these pagans. We just lease it to these unbelievers. They're just you know it's them doing it. Yes, them doing that in their facility. So you know Jews to this day, many of Jews know how to get around <laughs> the word of God and get around the pl- the law of God. As one of my elderly friends from uh, north part northern part of Serbia said. Her son lives in Israel and uh, all of his immediate family lives in Israel. She said to me, oh, I was in Israel, beautiful country. But, you know, Jews know how to bargain with God. (laughs) Or at least they think they know how to bargain with God. Well, this is here the same, brethren. Oh, yes, we're God's people, surely. Look, we keep the days of unleavened bread. Yes, we lease our uh, production facility to those who will... Uh, who will be making leaven and yeast uh, and leaven products, but hey, we are God's people, you know. Here in the Old Testament, yes, we are God's people. That gives us freedom to do whatever. That gives us freedom to serve all the gods that we want. Look, we are God's people. We have freedom to do that. The same reason in the Anglo-Saxon world, well, yeah, we have got freedom to do whatever, whatever I wish, whatever I want. But the problem is, yes, you have freedom, but that is not going to end well for you. The same with the house of Judah, that's not going to end, 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 end well for you, because another holocaust is just around the corner, and it's not only, it will not be only a holocaust of Judah, or the house of Judah, it will be also the holocaust of Ephraim, or the holocaust of the house of Israel. For the children, uh, verse 29 Cut off your hair and cast it away. This is what God says (laughs) to to this rebellious nation through um, prophet prophet Jeremiah. Cast off your uh, cut off your hair and cast it away. Okay, you have escaped. Oh, here it is. And take up a lamentation on the desolate heights, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of His wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. Well, brethren, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Well, (laughs) you know what? In Rome, they do that all the time. They found that black statue somewhere, black statue supposedly Peter, you know. They set it up in their church, and they made a god out of it. They say it's Peter. They take all the old Parthenon buildings around Rome, and they gave them... Christian names. And what else did they do? Well, they designed all the other buildings out of the Parthenon, circular dome. They set their abominations in the house, which is called by God's name. That includes Christmas trees as well. The Jews call it Hanukkah, though. They would not there call it Christmas, of course. They pollute God's house. Verse 31, And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. So God says, you think it was ancient history when they passed their children through the fire and burned their children to these gods in that valley of the sons of Hinnom? By having your sons practice paganism in Christian churches, you are dooming them 
to the fire too. That's exactly what is the message. You see, God never in his heart would think about that practice, having someone have their sons pass through the fire in the name of religion. God would not have a human sacrifice in the name of religion. God does not have some secret places, a valley of hell, where you practice a weird religion. No. But it's all what man devises in his evil heart, led by Satan, of course. Verse 32, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. So we have Tophets and Hinoms in our own Christian nations, brethren. But they are no longer called Tophet or Hinom. They are just places where people practice their paganism in Christian churches, you see. They practice their paganism because on those pagan holidays, children were sacrificed. Well, now they celebrate those holidays as Christian holidays. They just label them Christian. There's nothing Christian about them. There's no Christ in those holidays at all. There's no God in those holidays. God is present only in the time that He sacrificed, that He sanctified, I wanted to say. On the time when He sanctified, and He sanctified the seventh day from the creation, and then later when the house of Israel left Egypt, God has given them, well, while they were still in Egypt, that He gave them the Passover command, so that they will be reminded constantly of the Messiah coming and who needs to be sacrificed for their sins. Then he gave them, and remi- or rather reminded them, of all of his holidays, his sacred times, in which he is present. So, we are no, no longer do we have the names Tophet or Hinnom. Yes, but we have places where people practice their paganism in Christian churches. Those are their, our uh, symbolic Tophets and Hinnoms. And it's going to bring on God's slaughter. Now can you imagine the kind of trouble we're going to have when we tell the Protestant churches all that in the Anglo-Saxon world? And the kind of trouble we're going to be in when we tell all the other so-called Christian churches the same thing? Well, brethren, it says, lift up my voice and uh, tell my people their sins. So yes, the trouble will probably come, but sure. Somebody has to tell them. And no wonder Jesus Christ told us We are going to be hated by all the nations. That's not far away anyway. Verse 33. The corpses of these people will be food for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And no one will frighten them away. You see, all countries surrounding the modern house of Israel are going to devour pieces of their territory. (laughs) Just recently, I don't know if you noticed, at least here in the Serbian news, we have read that uh, we have read that Russia threatened America if they're going to use uh, Russian assets in America to rebuild Ukraine. Russia is going to take over Alaska again, brethren. One of these days is going to happen. Doctor Thiel has given us pro, uh, has given us messages about that. But you see, it's interesting that Russia mentioned that Alaska. They'll take care of Alaska again. They'll take control over Alaska again. One of these days when the death comes, Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk prophesies, when the death comes and the death, when those that have been, uh, that are uh, creditors to America, once they come, well, Chinese and others, the territory of America and the Anglo-Saxon world might be given to, uh, to their creditors, you know. China obviously loves Australia so much. There's plenty of real estate now owned by Chinese in Australia. Huh? Not to mention American debt. That can never be repaid anyway. Not to mention New Zealand. Not to mention Canada. So the Anglo-Saxon world is going to be partitioned when it comes to their territories. Verse 34. Then I'll cause to cease... From the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. This is prophecy. Chapter 8, let's go with, we can cover one one more chapter anyway. Chapter 8, verse 1, at that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. You see, brethren, the Babylonians had a custom to desecrate the graves of conquered nations. They often looted graves for wealth. Back in those times, 
they buried all the prosperity of the leaders with them. Now we notice who is held accountable for it. First kings, as it says, then prince, the princes, next the priests, then the prophets. Now you know if priests didn't did do their job, they would not need prophets. Do you realize that? If priests could get people to practice the truth, there was no need for prophets. And as long as the people practiced the truth, there were no prophets. Yes, we have Bob Thiel, who we consider by all his, all his fruits, to be the prophet of our end time, to be the prophet in the churches of God, if you wish, brethren. What does that tell you? Well, that, that, tell, that tells you that the priests were not practicing the truth and they were not really doing their job properly. So there was a need for a prophet. For which we should be very thankful because nowhere and uh, never in the past have we had this refined and precise understanding of the Bible prophecy. Thanks to Dr. Bob Thiel, he has refined so much of our understanding that we now very, very well, we know where we are heading. We know when the Great Tribulation will start. We believe that we know who will most likely be the European coming dictator. So brethren, but that's all the fact that the priests were not doing their work. The priests in all these churches of God don't preach the prophecy because it's too negative. They don't go around the world preaching to the Gentiles because they want to stay in the uh, prosperous Anglo-Saxon world and have members who will be giving, you know, out of rich wages to those churches. It's only us. We go around the world. We preach to the go- we preach the gospel to the to the, to the, to the Gentiles. This week we began. On the shortwave band radio, Dr. Bob Thiel made uh, introductory comments and there have been my three of my messages over that radio. And the radio is basically reaching Europe, Gentile nations, but also Israelitish nations, uh, North Africa and parts of the Middle East, which is great. We're reaching both Gentiles and Israelites. But also through the New Zealand radio and also through... Uh, uh, the radio, the Hope of Israel, which was uh, which was established on my behalf by my friend in Canada, we are reaching basically the whole world, brethren, Gentiles and Israelites alike, because the gospel is to be preached, you know, but the true gospel is to be preached for the world, not 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 not, not, not lies, not half truths. You see, sadly, many of those ministers in these churches of God they preach half truths because. How can you preach the full truth if you ignore one-third of the Bible, which is called the prophecy? Bible News Prophecy, we are the only church of God that has a public program named after that, which contains the word prophecy, brethren, because we are not afraid of the prophecy. I know, we know there are horrible things coming up, but, you know, we're not afraid. We must be preaching them. We must be preaching those prophecies in hope that at least some individuals in both Israelitish nations and Gentile nations might repent. So, since the priests are not doing their job, they were not doing their job, preaching the full truth, God raised a prophet for our time. Verse 2. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon, those bones of those kings and and princes, before the sun and before the moon, and all the host of heaven, which they have loved, and which they have served, and after which they were walked, which which they have sought and which they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. So brethren, you see, all their gods, which they worship, will not be capable of doing a thing about their graves being ravished and their bones left unburied right under the host of heaven. Those are the gods whom they worship. So let them lie out their barren before their gods and see if they can help them. You know, gods whom they loved and whom they served and whom they walked after, whom they sought and whom they worshipped. Yeah, here are their gods. What they will do about their bones? Nothing. And it says that they'll spread their bones before the sun. Sun was the center of their religion of Baalism. The Bible is just saturated with the accounts of Israelites worshipping sun. And the modern churchianity is saturated with all rituals and uh, uh, ceremonies which actually are sun worshipping. Verse 3. The death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. You see, brethren, those people that are driven, 
they would rather die in the place where they are driven than endure the punishment and heathen powers that are going to be torturing them. Verse 4, Moreover, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Well, no. He already told us that he is going to save the tithe, the tenth part, the tenth part, the tithe, as we have been aware of. God's system has always been tithe. It will always be that way. And I am appealing to those of you who are listening to this message and haven't, tithe, and haven't started tithing yet, you have to do it if you want to truly be close to God and have a relationship with Him. Tithing is a challenge God gave not only to the Christians, but to the whole world. Test me, said God. And the tithing is, I remember the old, old the traditional teaching of the Church of God, tithing is actually required for all humanity, brethren, which God gave as a challenge to humankind so that man can test God and see whether he'll be blessed or not. Those of you who want to be baptized, you need to start tithing. That's the fruit of your repentance. And if you have recognized where God is working, when you are convinced that God is working in a certain place, like here, well, you're obligated to start tithing. That's one of those, you might say, test uh, ordinance of God. The test commandment is the Sabbath commandment, and the test ordinance, you might say, would be tithing. No, it's not Mosaic law. Abraham, our father in faith, was the one who started that practice. And his posterity continued. And then, to this day, this ordinance has remained in place. Yes, out of tithing, Levitical priesthood was funded in the Old Testament. Nowadays, Christ has another kind of priesthood. Not Levitical priesthood, but another kind of priesthood. And that priesthood is here to uh, also is to be financed. So the whole work of God is to be financed by faithful members. After all, how do you me how do you imagine to be accounted worthy to escape all these things coming and making it into the place of safety if you're not tithing? I I, I don't know. And I'm not sure what is unclear about that doctrine. That's I from what I hear this week. Some of you who are baptism candidates didn't start tithing. Well. Sorry, but then you're not really baptism candidates. Verse 5. Why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem, in a perpetual backsliding, they hold fast to deceit, they refuse to return. So they are hard-headed, brethren, and they are set in their own ways, blinded by false Christianity, telling them they are safe and secure. All that you need to do is just receive Christ in your heart. Even when they are hurt, they would not admit the cause of their hurt. Verse 6, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. You see, brethren, repentance is individual. It's first step in building the relationship with God. But nobody can read your heart, brethren. I'm now appealing mostly to those who have been counseled by me for baptism. I cannot read your heart and it's not my job to read your heart. My job is to be the helper of your joy. Repentance is a personal thing. It's individual. Each person needs to ask himself or herself, what have I done? But people don't even do this. They plunge into sin. I mean people of this world. They are trained to sin just as a horse is trained to go into battle. Now, this is an example of some expressions used in the Bible like all Israel shall be saved. It doesn't mean every single one. Here it says that no man repented. Now, of course, it doesn't mean every single one. It means such a big majority of them would not in comparison as if no man repented. There are Laodiceans, quite few of them that are going to repent. There is going to be a tithe of Israel after flesh that is going to repent. So it shows us how to better understand the terminology of the Bible. We let the Bible interpret itself when it says, no man repenting of his wickedness. It means practically none. Such a high percentage, 90%, no man in this case is 90%. Verse 7, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed time, and the turtle dove, the swift and the swallow, observe the time of their coming, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. So God is telling us here that he has created the migration patterns of the birds. 
it is built into them. God put it there. It cannot be changed by evolution or any other way. Just as the instincts of those birds tell them where to go in cold days and where to return in the spring, so should have the higher principles told these rebellious people how to return to God. They don't know the judgment of God. They don't realize, they don't recognize it when the weather gets mixed up, when their finances collapse or when their marriages break up and their children desert home. No, nobody takes that as a judgment of God. They don't know the judgment of the eternal indeed. Verse 8, How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. Brethren, people are not wise. And what is the opposite of being wise? <laughs> you know. Verse 9, The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the words of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Well, all the wise men have rejected the word of the eternal. They used to say, for example, of late Herbert Armstrong, that he oversimplified everything, you know. Now, it cannot be that simple. They thought, well, 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 what else do you think that the truth of God should be? Complicated? Complex? So they said that Herbert Armstrong, you know, oversimplified things, you know. Uh, why, you know? All it says and all the problems, well, for example, just stick your nose in the Bible and practice all it says and all the problems would be solved. <laughs> Why? That is simple, they would say. That is just oversimplifying all of man's solutions to all of man's problems. So God says the wise are ashamed. They have no answer. They have no solutions. But people say, but oh, we are wise. The law of God is with us. We are Christian. Verse 10, therefore I give, I'll give them I'll give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them because from the least even to the greatest everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest everyone deals falsely. So he twice says that everyone is given to covetousness. When God repeats something it must be mighty important. Wouldn't you say that the modern nations of Israel are given over to materialism? Get, get, get more, get more and more physical. And they just sit around enjoying life, creation, the Bible. No, 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 brethren. From the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Priests don't know the truth, while the prophets lie about what is going to happen. Verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, three times we heard that already. Any would... Any wound that makes the people of God wake up are healed by those prophets. There might be people who would wake up and hearken and listen, but no, they heal the hurt slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they say they shall fall among the, those who fall. In the time of their punishment, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. You know, brethren, God has planned this and it will happen. Verse 13. I'll surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the wine, no, nor figs on the fig tree, nor the leaf shall fade. And the things I've given them shall pass away from them. You see, after God told Jeremiah to tell them all, all that, Jeremiah asks them in verse 14, the following. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter the fortified city and let us be silent there for the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace but no good came and for a time of health and there was trouble. You see, this invasion was so imminent you could hear the snorting of the horses from Dan. Verse 16, the snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. You know, there again it shows the invasion came from the north, brethren. In the north, north, north. The invaders, like the horses, they come and they devour all the land. Now Dan is the most northern tribe of Israel and even today that is the case. Denmark and Ireland, the descendants of Dan, are the most northern nations in Europe. Now bordering right with Denmark is the greatest power in Europe, Germany. 
which is right now creating the European army, the same army that will invade the modern house of Israel in our imminent future. Verse 17. For behold, I'll send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. I will comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Now this is what Jeremiah says. My heart is faint in me. Listen, verse 19. The voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? Oh, no, 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 eternal is not there. He has forsaken them, and now they're going to be taken and invaded. They provoke God with their images and vanity. They removed his protection over them. Brethren, there comes a time when the protection over Judah and Jerusalem will be removed in our times, which will result in a local Middle Eastern nuclear war, which will trigger the uh, involvement of Europe into the Middle East affairs, and... Uh, the European envoy most likely will be the man we have been watching closely, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. And then from then we'll proceed on to the, you know, to the next events that are related to the end time and the end of this, of this, uh, lawless and godless world. Now verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me, says this weeping Jeremiah prophet, the man who was a indeed a great a patriot. He loved his people. Verse 22. Oh, this reminds me of that song, There is a Balm in Gilead. But is there no Balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? Well, you see, scriptures like this show that there is a, a balm from Gilead. There are certain things that God has created that are natural, and he means for people to know about it and help other people with it. There should be a balm of Gilead. There should be a physician. It should be God and his way of life physically. There are physical things man can do as well. There are physical things man can do, and the man does. Well, brethren, we have just read chapters 7 and chapter 8. So next time we'll continue reading the book of Jeremiah and we'll, we'll be reading chapter 9 and perhaps chapter 10.